Hello and welcome back to my Amateur Radio General License class course. You know, a good attitude is the cornerstone of safety. That coupled with good habits will not only keep us safe, but also our family, friends, and neighbors as well. In general, amateur radio is not considered a dangerous uh, hobby or endeavor. Even so, a little bit of knowledge will go a really long way, and it's important for the safety of all concerned. It's been known since the early days of Tesla and Marconi that radio RF energy can cause injuries by heating body tissue. It seems only logical to learn how to avoid being cooked. Well, are you ready to learn? Well, let's get started. This is the Amateur Radio General Class Licensed Course, Lesson 10. I'm your instructor, Gary Stevens, Kilo Echo 2 Gulf Sierra. This is sub-element Gulf Zero, G0, and there are two exam questions from True Groups. There's a total of 25 questions. And this covers the 2019 to 2023 general class FCC element three question pool, which went into effect on July 1st of 2019. This is electrical and radio frequency safety part one. This is uh, section Gulf Zero Alpha which deals with radio frequency safety principles, rules and guidelines, and routine station evaluations. Let's begin our safety lessons by understanding how radio frequency energy affects human tissue. Can you imagine your hands being inside a microwave oven? Well, what do you think would happen if, it, if they were? Would it surprise you to learn that microwave ovens use uh, radio frequency energy? Uh, typically in the 2.45 gigahertz range, uh, which is in the UHF band. For the exam, you need to know that one way that RF energy can affect human body tissue is that it heats body tissue. For safety, we need to ask the question, what properties are essential in estimating if an RF signal exceeds the maximum permissible exposure, or MPE? Three things determine uh, MPE. Uh, one is uh, duty cycle, the other is frequency, and the last is uh, power density. We should always assume 100% duty cycle when our calculations. Uh, frequencies, the higher the frequency, the greater the heating, and the power density, uh, the volume that's being radiated. For example, a 1200 watt microwave oven will cook faster than an 800 watt oven will. And the same is true for the energy coming out of your radio. For the exam, we need to know that the following properties are essential in estimating whether an RF signal exceeds a maximum permissible exposure, or MPE. It's duty cycle, it's frequency, it's power density. And on the exam, you will mark the correct answer, which is all these choices are correct. We should continually ask, does our station comply with the FCC's RF exposure regulations? And we should also ask ourselves, how can we determine if it is? One way we can do this is uh, calculate using the uh, FCC OET bulletin number 65, which deals with the uh, compliance with the FCC guidelines for human exposure and radio frequency electromagnetic fields. If you really want to get into the nuts and bolts of things, you can always uh, search the, uh, the web for some computer modeling software that would calculate the uh, RF energy outputs and the radiation patterns for you uh, to do a simulation. 
And of course the tried and true method is to uh, secure a uh, field strength meter and take measurements uh, according to the guidelines in the uh, FCC bulletins. For the exam, you need to know that you can determine that your station complies with the FCC RF exposure regulations by calculation based on FCC OET bulletin number 65, by calculation based on computer modeling, or by measurement of speed, uh, field strength using a calibrated equipment. For the exam, you need to mark all these choices are correct. Safety, we also need to know what is meant by the term time averaging uh, in regards to RF radiation exposure. Time averaging is just a method that's used to find an average level of radiation, um, RF type radiation, at a given point. For example, you could use a field strength meter to take a measurement every 15 minutes for 8 hours and then average those readings. You know, simple math. For the exam, you need to know that regarding radiofrequency radiation exposure, what is meant by time averaging is the total radiofrequency exposure averaged over a certain period of time or a certain amount of time. For safety, we need to ask ourselves, what must we do if an evaluation of our station shows RF energy radiated from our station exceeds permissible limits? This should be intuitively obvious, but if we find in our evaluation that our station is non-compliant to uh, the permissible limits, we need to take action to correct it. For the exam, we need to know that if an evaluation of your station shows that RF energy radiated from your station exceeds permissible limits, take action to prevent human exposure to the excessive radio frequency fields. Another safety question we should ask ourselves is what precautions should we take when installing a ground mounted antenna? When you were a child did you like to climb on things? I know I did. And we all want a nice antenna tower in our backyard but we have to be careful that this doesn't happen. All units, there is a juvenile climbing an antenna tower on Elm Street. Just like one would put a fence around the pool to keep the neighborhood kids from sneaking in and drowning, we need to do something to protect our antennas so that uh, kids don't climb on them as well. For the exam, we need to know that when installing a ground mounted antenna, it should be installed uh, such that it is protected against unauthorized access, particularly by small children. For safety, we need to ask ourselves. How does a transmitter's duty cycle affect radio frequency exposure? When we're dealing with data modes, the transmitter is keyed on and off whether there's information to be passed or not. Um, this particular chart shows that at 25% of the duty cycle, you can see that it's on 25% of the time, 50% of the time, 75% of the time, and 100% duty cycle respectively. So 100% is obviously more dangerous because you're kicking out energy 100% of the time. And we need to know that a transmitter's duty cycle affects RF exposure because a lower transmitter duty cycle permits greater short-term exposure levels. Another safety question we should ask ourselves is what do we do if our transmitter uh, power exceeds the levels specified in FCC Part 97.13. This is a snippet of FCC Section 97.13c and you'll notice that uh, most of the values here exceed the uh, values of a transceiver uh, that comes right out of the box or one that's running barefoot or that's to say without an amplifier. When you add an amplifier you could uh, very well exceed some of these limits and then you need to uh, follow the advice of uh, the FCC. For the exam, you need to know to ensure compliance with RF safety regulations when transmitter power exceeds levels specified in FCC uh, Part 97.13, perform a routine RF exposure evaluation. 
For safety, we should ask ourselves, what instrument can we use to accurately measure an RF field? And of course, what we would use is a calibrated field strength meter uh, coupled with a calibrated antenna. So for the exam, we need to know that an instrument we can use to measure an RF field accurately is a calibrated field strength meter with a calibrated antenna. Safety, we also need to ask, what should we do if our directional antenna might be giving our neighbor more than the allowable limit of RF exposure? For example, sometimes we may be uh, wanting an antenna, a directional antenna like a Yagi, and we run out of funds. We can, or we only have so much mast available, and we're anxious to get it up in the air. Um, and it's not quite high enough, so it just kind of points at one of the neighbor's houses. And of course, after realizing what a bonehead move we had just performed, uh, we get some more antenna mast and elevate it above the house, and everyone is safe. For the exam, we need to know if an evaluation shows that our neighbor might receive more than an allowable limit of RF exposure from the main lobe of a directional antenna, we need to take precautions to ensure that that antenna cannot be pointed in their direction. Another safety question we should ask is, can we safely use or install an antenna indoors? Homeowner associations are notorious for bounding outside antennas, and this forces many hams to place them inside their attics. No matter if you use a home-brewed antenna, as in this photo, or a commercial antenna shown in this one, always do your due diligence and perform a safety evaluation. For the exam, you need to know that if we want to install an antenna indoors for transmitting, we need to make sure that the MPE limits are not exceeded in the occupied areas. This is the end of Electrical and RF Safety Part 1. You may have noticed that the video format is a little different this time. It's completely different than the rest of the series. I'm experimenting with new ways to improve the quality and to make these uh, lessons a little more engaging. Please leave your thoughts uh, about these changes below in the comment section. And if you feel so inclined, please subscribe and uh, like uh, my channel. Uh, there's just one more lesson to go, so hang in there. You can do this. Until next time, 73 and never stop learning.